Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning. We'll leave it uh, still a couple of minutes for people to connect. Great, I think very soon we will start. Just give it a couple of more seconds for, for people to connect because I know that in the US it might be early. In Europe, we're after lunch, so it's okay. <laughs> so let's start. Um, great, well, uh, first of all, um, welcome everybody. And I want to take the opportunity to thank everybody that registered to this webinar. I know it's difficult sometimes to connect, um, but the interest shown by the registrants has been um, very positive. So we have about 100 people on LinkedIn. So welcome on LinkedIn and about 100, I think, 60 people that registered on Zoom. So great to see this, uh, this momentum. Um, I know it's, um, it's a hot topic to try to see how we can deploy innovative business models to actually scale more value to, to customers on the market, but also establish really win-win partnerships with customers instead of just selling assets to customers. So welcome everybody. This is a webinar organized by the SET Alliance. Uh, today, I'm your host, uh, Dimitri Skaramitsos. So pleasure to be here. And today we will be tackling actually the topic of the path to efficiency as a service. Um, so we will look into a step-by-step -step guide to creating customer value. And why did we launch uh, this topic? It's because through the support um, that we provide on the market and through conversations that we have also with end beneficiaries, we see that very often product as a service might appear like an alternative way to finance assets. And at the end of the day, what it really is, it's far more than this. So it's uh, making sure that you deliver an extra value to the end customer. So comparing basically an asset price to a product as a service value proposition is not a one-to-one -one comparison. So uh, us at Bayes, for you to know, we are the secretariat and the founder of the SET Alliance. What is the SET Alliance? The SET Alliance is governed by a steering committee where we have the privilege to have um, two companies on board that have been very active on deploying cooling as a service and refrigeration as a service in the market. So this is CARE and Energy Partners, as well as two universities that are very active into the research topic of servitization and two consultancies as well that are from one side very active on as a service, but as well looking at how to deploy more impactful climate cooling technologies, because we did work a lot in the sector of cooling. However, today we will really look at this model from a broader perspective. And this is really also the role of the SET Alliance that is bringing actors from multiple backgrounds that are really pioneering this model and this value proposition on the market. So uh, just a, a few house rules before we start. I think what is really, really key, uh, and we have uh, the chance to have a rich audience today connected, please, please share your questions to uh, the panelists. Um, challenge them uh, because it's through challenges that we actually learn to innovate. So don't be afraid to ask questions. No questions is a wrong question. 
Um, and after the session as well, we will actually have a little survey popping up where we really appreciate your feedback on this session so that we can see what we can improve, but also any topics that you see are relevant for you, don't hesitate to bring them up so that we can discuss it with the community that we have to see what we need to bring forward uh, to the market. Um, so here on the right as well, you can actually follow the Set Alliance uh, on LinkedIn and you can connect us through, uh, th through this email, info at setalliance.org. And you can visit actually the, uh, the website of the Set Alliance to view any of the recordings and the case studies and the articles that we publish on the topic. So uh, without further ado, today we have really the privilege to have an exceptional panel with Florian André from uh, P2S Management Consulting. So he's the CEO and the founder of the company as well, Dominique Planck, who's the CEO of ETAP Lighting International, and Dr. Elvira Rakova, who's the CEO and founder of Directin, and Dawi Kriel, who's the general manager at Energy Partners Refrigeration. So without bidding due, I would like to introduce the speakers and to let them basically introduce themselves. So um, Dominique, please, um, you can go first. And I think we don't hear you. You're on mute. Audio should be on before I talk. <laughs> so very briefly, I'm Dominic Plank, the CEO of Eta Lighting International. We are an SME, family owned, but already for more than 75 years in the lighting industry um, and at the cutting edge of what lighting has to offer. Uh, so what we actually are offering are general lighting solutions for uh, applications like offices, industry, schools, um, sports, et cetera, um, but also emergency lighting solutions. Uh, based in Malle, very close to Antwerp in Belgium, and we have roughly 275 employees. So I hand over to Elvira. Thank you, Dominique. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is Elvira and uh, I'm an expert in compressed air efficiency and now we're providing compressed air efficiency as a service. A uh, couple of words about uh, our company. Uh, if we can go next slide, please, Dimitris. Perfect. So, been in the industry about 12 years uh, from research and development to industrial field. Uh, we developed our software for design, optimization, and monitoring of compressed air systems, uh, starting from generation, distribution, and to the final use of this. And in the past two years, we had about 20 projects uh, on the optimizations of the um, compressed air systems. And then I guess next one is Florian, right? No, sorry. <laughs> Dawi. Ah, thank you very much, and <clears throat> thanks to Set Alliance for inviting Energy Partners and myself. Um, I'm Davi Krill, as um, Demetrius mentioned. Um, I'm the general manager for, of our refrigeration division, and I'm an engineer and have been in the refrigeration business for the last 30 years. Um, the next slide, Demetrius, please. Um, Energy Partners um, was established in 2009. And uh, we're in, in essence an investment business in the energy space. Um, we're also the pioneers of um, uh, uh, cooling as a service in the industrial refrigeration space, um, where we've been active for the last uh, nine years in uh, investing um, in our customers' refrigeration um, systems. We're also a company that are uh, investing in multiple kind of utilities, so also heating, power, and then we have two divisions um, that supports that is the asset management business and sustainability. Um, yeah, that's me. Thank you, uh, Florian. Thank you. Next. Thank you, Dawi, and thank you, Dimitris, and the whole uh, base and set alliance team. Um, I'm Florian, half German, half French, sitting here in Brussels, and uh, the founder of P2S, P2S standing for product to subscriptions. 
And what do we do? We work with B2B hardware companies um, to transform them into the Netflix of their industry, let's say. Uh, so uh, what we do is we're a boutique consultancy specialized in as a service and subscription models for physical products. Uh, so not the software side, but uh, for, for physical products. And what we do is we make your ambitions um, as a product company that wants to go towards more recurring revenue, more sustainability, um, more the Netflix model, we make this a reality. Uh, so we're, let's say, bridging the gap between between strategy, starting with strategy, conceptualizing how your subscription and as a service business model could look like for, for different product verticals, but also up until the, the implementation of those models. So working on setting up the financing structure, drafting the contracts, uh, up until the compensation model of your salespeople that need to be adapted if they sell your products on a subscription basis versus um, versus a normal um, versus a normal product, and we're we're sitting here, let's say, in 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 Brussels, but um, have 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 clients a bit all over the place. If we can have uh, yeah, a look also, I think what is the 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 common trait amongst all of them is they all sell physical or used to sell physical pieces um, of equipment of products of devices, and that are now all interested in going towards as a service, whether this is light as a service, energy as a service, inspection as a service, blasting as a service, or medical devices as a service. It goes in all directions, but it's always, let's say, yeah, taking the, the Netflix, the Spotify model, and how can more, if I may say, more conservative industries also reinvent uh, themselves to be, to, be, to be ready for the future. I think, Dimitris, over back to you again. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and actually, before we start uh, this session, um, so I was saying many thanks, everyone. And so before we start this session, I would like to invite actually our audience. Um, so again, thank you for connecting to share a few. Um, you will see there will be a quiz popping up on, on Zoom. And we want you to share a few keywords or phrases that come to your mind regarding opportunities or challenges when you think about product as a service. So really, what does it mean to you and how do you see it as potentially, like, um, what is it bringing to you as a, as a customer, or as a provider, uh, but also the challenges that you see. So it could be things related to worries on pricing, for instance, or on duration of contract. Um, so I'll let you, a uh, couple of seconds to answer this. Great. So still a couple of seconds. Great. Just trying to see where I see the um, the answers because I see quite a few of you provided some inputs. Okay. All right. Okay, we'll find out in a few minutes how to see the results, but many thanks for all of you for participating because we know we are a little bit on a tight schedule. Uh, so I'll share some of the answers in the chat um, as we move forward, but um, therefore let's jump onto the first topic, which is really looking at a more macro level on what it means really to develop an AS proposition. 
So without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Florian. Um, please share your screen and then you can uh, move forward. Can you hear my screen and see it? Uh, well, can you, can you see my screen and hear me? <laughs> no? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. The good one, not the presenter mode. OK, let me. Yes, works. Um, perfect. Where could a subscription or an as a service business model be developed? Um, so my aim is a bit to, to, to take you on, let's say, a transformation journey or questions uh, that, that, that you could be asking yourself if you want to develop a subscription model within within your company well probably the first question is going to be for where do you develop this right do you develop this for for your pieces of equipment um do you develop this um for so for a standalone asset for a fleet of of products that you have do you develop it for only a, a sub component or 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 a software piece like digital products or or components or spare parts so i think what what what's important within a company is to ask yourself well a subscription business model could be developed for a lot of different applications um, an asset could be a standalone let's say an air compressor a fleet could be power tools hilti they're offering uh, the the power tools on a on a subscription basis a hardware component could be if we look at an injection molding machine then only the heart piece of the injection molding machine is being offered on a subscription basis um software industry i mean um probably have digital products that could be offered on a on a subscription basis and then consumables and spare parts could be also be offered on a subscription basis so um what I want to just to, to, to clarify with this is subscription models can be developed for also other things than just the pure equipment side. And if we look at if we look at companies, they're usually like manufacturing companies are usually quite uh, well set up in on, on the X axis. On the X axis, what I mean is in terms of what they sell. They sell equipment, they sell maintenance contracts, they sell sometimes digital products, but they usually sell them in a one-off kind of way. And so what I mean by that is you exchange a product for some money, right? Um, but if we look at the y-axis, the idea of subscription models is that you align the your pricing mechanism, your revenue model as a provider with the success metric of a customer. And so this could be cubic meters of compressed air, or I'm thinking about it up with, with lighting. Well, probably customers don't care that much about the lighting system itself. They care about the light they get out of it, right? Or um, with, with Dawi, with, with, with cooling, you're interested in a certain, in a certain temperature and a certain performance, not in the equipment itself. So we're going towards outcome-based model, performance-based model. And I think this is very interesting. You probably know the example of Rolls-Royce with the turbines uh, of, of airplanes, um, where in the end, they charge per flying hour. Um, so every hour where a plane is flying, this is um, when Rolls-Royce is going to invoice their customers uh, for. So what, what, what's interesting about this model and what, what, what you have to remember is it's about selling the outcome, the performance, the usage of a solution and not selling the um, solution itself. And um, there's a lot of examples. I mean, Atlas Copco that sells cubic meters of uh, compressed air or, or Kaiser compressors. We have it in the medical device industry for uh, MRI scanners where they're charging per uh, patient that has been uh, that has been treated, um, for instance. Um, so there's 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 a lot of or or blasting equipment, sand blasting equipment, where you have a, a model where you almost give away for free the sand blasting equipment, but you're charging uh, per consumables that 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 go with it. So there's a lot of different let's say applications to 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 subscription based to subscription as a service based um, models and but. What, what's really key here, it's it's a change in the business model itself and the logic, and it's not just a new 
financing model or leasing plus plus, let's say. So I think this is really key to 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 understand here. Um, there's some numbers, of course, also to 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 back it up. Let let me let me share a few of them. Here, um, Zora, Zora is a subscription software, uh, subscription management software company, and they do a lot of research and benchmarking related to um, companies offering subscriptions with the ones that do not offer subscriptions. And here they have benchmarked only in the manufacturing industry companies that offer subscriptions with the ones that do not. And uh, what it shows us, just the revenue growth is a lot superior for the ones that are offering subscriptions, which which brings me to another point, which we hear a lot coming from, let's say, manufacturing companies is I need to exit the project business. Uh, this quarter has been excellent. The next quarter, I've um, I've I've not many orders coming in. Um, so there's a lot of manufacturing companies, especially with the with the with the uncertain times that we're experiencing at the moment, that are struggling with uncertainty with the lack of predictability well the numbers show that companies offering subscription models have a lot more stability in their revenue which brings them stability in their business and their operations and which um yeah which just has a lot of a lot of different advantages um to 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 them and then um a last number which i wanted to share with you is here a study uh, by uh, by McKinsey and Future Bridge, where they looked at manufacturers that offer their equipment on a subscription basis and as let's say traditional sales, and they looked at what are the implications on revenue and margins over the complete lifespan of the equipment, and we see that uh, the numbers are are, are quite positive. Um, but what is important to mention, I mean subscriptions. You're not going to see any any benefits in the first six months. Probably, it's going to be um, it's a long game. Uh, so it is something where if you have a medium to long term vision for your company, then subscriptions might be uh, an interesting model to pursue. But it does, let's say, take um, take time to 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 yield those um, to yield those uh, more 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 positive results. Which which brings us to, I think. For me, the most interesting point uh, to to subscription models, which is this win win win. Uh, what do uh, I mean with win win win? It is a model that is beneficial for for a for a provider, for, whether this is a manufacturer or a distributor, but also beneficial for customers, of course. And then um, also from a sustainability point of view, this is a model that is part of the circular economy. What is the idea behind it is that, well, who is best placed to, let's say, assume the responsibilities over, of a product over the complete lifespan of, um, of the product than the one that has manufactured it themselves. Um, so it has quite positive implications from a sustainability point of view, uh, which incentivizes um, manufacturers to produce products that last longer. The whole concept of programmed obsolescence, I mean, we don't talk about it that much, but here, um, as you understand, this doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, every, every, It's better to have less products on the market that are being used more than uh, to sell as high quantities as possible. So from a sustainability, and I started with the right-hand side, um, now moving to uh, the manufacturer point of view, well, the manufacturer stable recurring revenue, um, I mentioned it, but then also monetizing the complete life cycle of a product and then building a lot deeper relationship with your customers. Uh, you have ongoing relationship, ongoing contracts with, with, with your customers, which gives you a lot more touch points in the end with them. But from my point of view, the most interesting thing about subscription models is it positions you as a true partner, which has the best customer's interest in mind and is financially incentivized uh, to do so. Uh, so whether this is about guaranteeing a certain cooling level, whether this is gar guaranteeing a certain illuminance level over time, it, it aligns the incentives from a provider with the ones of the customer. And which, which brings us to why it's interesting from a customer point of view. Well, You've all heard it from, from your customers or from your prospects. It's, it's always too expensive, right? Uh, so investment hurdles at the beginning 
are something to to overcome. Um, there were quite some changes in in leasing in IFRS 16 in 2019, so that leasing needs to figure on the balance sheet. Well, the good news is that as a service models, uh, we can still make it off balance sheet. So there's let's say accounting advantages for certain customers, but but then mostly there it's this predictability, this this outsourcing of risk, um, which is attractive from a customer point of view and then having flexibility um, we all know it from our private lives we want flexibility whether this is a subscription for children bicycles whether this is a netflix subscription whether this is a uh, hello fresh food subscription we want flexibility we want to be able to to exit to a certain degree to 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 not be let's say handcuffed for for, for too much of a time um, and again here subscription models and as a service models allow just that which brings me to a point which is, I mean, all this sounds amazing, right? For your manufacturer, this sounds great, but how to get started, right? And so here um, we've listed the very few questions manufacturers or distributors ask themselves when they want to get started with with, with subscription models. And, and probably, I mean, you, you've a lot of different products. And the first question is, well, for which product vertical should we should we start with, right? Um, and then for, for, for which geographical and for which customers is, is this attractive? And another question might be packaging. Like you've seen this good, better, best approach that with these three tiers that we see a lot in subscription models, well, is this the right model to go for for your subscription or should you opt for something something different? And then, I mean, we talk as a service, but then, well, how do customers need to pay us, right? Is it running hours? Is it cubic meters? Is it air quality? Is it a certain performance uh, metric? Is it the number of bottles that have been produced? So what is the right, let's say, pricing metric here? Then digital uh, digitalization, I think it, it goes without speaking that, well, you need IoT enabled products if you want to be charging per running hour or usage based. And then perhaps a less fun topic, but the, the IT infrastructure, well, your probably your legacy ERP systems are not designed to handle recurring billing. So this is something that needs to be worked on. Um, financing and accounting. I mean, you got to set up a, a, a financing structure for it. You, you, whether this is, I mean, for you as a, for you as a provider, but then your customers are going to ask you, well, how do I, how do I recognize the costs? How do you recognize the revenue? These are questions which clauses need to figure in the contract. But from what we have seen, the thing that is hardest is sales and company culture. Um, your company has perhaps been on the market for decades selling products in a normal way. Now you want to sell a solution over time on a usage basis. Well, oof, this is hard to get their heads around, right? Uh, you, so you gotta, you gotta adapt the whole organization. And I want to I want to I want to mention also the the how to get started very concretely and, and and a few words on how you could organize such a subscription innovation project. Well, um, the good news is we we've done the job for you. Um, we've come up with a methodology where kind of step by step. Uh, you tackle all those key points that need to be tackled, whether this is financing, pricing, for which products, for which customers, compensation model of your sales uh, teams, how to train them on how to sell subscriptions, how to train your customers on how to procure, how to purchase subscriptions. So there's tons of things, let's say, that need to be thought about. Um, and what, what we come to the table with is an extremely structured methodology to tackle all those all those key uh, the, those key points. Um, if you think, okay, this is great, but I mean, we're not a bank, right? Yes, you're completely right. You are not a bank as a provider. This is why there's expert partner companies out there that can help uh, with this. There's paper use financiers. There is law practice that have drafted as a service contracts. There is, I mentioned Zor, subscription management software companies that can help you with automating the recurring billing of things within within your IT systems. The good news again is we've scouted the right partners that can help you on this innovation journey um, as well. I've been running a bit over time. Dimitris, how do we look? Do we look at the case study or do we do, do we skip that one? Uh, maybe we can keep this, the case study for indeed the round table at the end, if you want to share. Maybe one um, question that popped up in the audience, which uh, we could take, 
and it will be also a question we could look into into the round table and also for DAWI afterwards. So the question comes in and says, as a cooling as a service provider, where does the energy you use to power the cooling system sit in terms of the customer's scope one, two, or three emissions? Does the carbon associated with cooling now go from a customer's scope two to become their scope three emissions? Question mark. I think that we in the cooling industry will be much better placed to 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 answer that exact question if 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 Dawi, that's all right. Perfect. All right, yes, we <laughs> go, go for it, Dawi. I will try, but I'm you know it's it was depends how we write our contracts. Um so the, we have customers where that um, carbon uh, um, credit sits with the customer and, and in other cases, it's, it's with us mostly. Um, it sits with the owner of the refrigeration system, uh, you know, as the primary uh, function, but, but you can write your contracts um, in, in a way which would make it possible to, to transfer that to, the, to your customer. Super. I, I don't think, yeah, <laughs> it's not simple. Um, and and, and unfor unfortunately for us in South Africa, it's not a big factor yet. You know, carbon credits are not a big thing in the developing world. Uh, it's really in the developed world where I think it plays a much bigger role. Mm -hmm. And um, Dominic, in, in your case, is it like, um, because the way I see it is uh, scope two is the um, everything a customer purchases, right? So. That means ideally, I mean, energy is in their scope too. So now that let's say the the lamps, let's say, or the cooling is not on the balance sheet of the customer, but is basically on the balance sheet of a of a third uh, of a second entity. Let's say that means then those emissions are uh, embedded into scope two and scope three. Or how how do you see that? Well, you know, it, it, when you talk about the energy, the energy is still purchased by the by that same customer, and, and, and therefore nothing changes. And so, of course, if you think about the CO2 uh, um, embedded in the product itself, um, yeah, then, then basically it's not anymore something that belongs to them. Right? Mm -hmm. So and then it moves scope. But, but that's, in the case of lighting, a very small part of the, of the whole CO2 footprint. And the majority is actually the energy being used during the operation. If you do an LCA calculation, you will see. Very many thanks. Um, there we? Yeah, I said that's correct. Uh, in, in the refrigeration as well, even though it's outsourced from our perspective, um, the customer still buys and pays for the electricity directly to the supplier. And we then buy from the customer to run the refrigeration system. So from that perspective there, um, I agree with Dominic. Perfect, actually that's a great transition uh, because there we, you're, you're up next. So um, oh, we would like yeah. to actually now deep dive a little bit closer to uh, particular solutions on the market. So here uh, that we will present in the case of Energy Partners Refrigeration, really the basically how they've been deploying cooling as a service. So I'll mute myself and please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I assume my screen is showing. Um, yes. Thank you. Yeah, so I think, um, let me just move this uh, little box. I think servitization, um, more specifically, and, and Florian spoke about this, but cooling as a service, it, it's really a transformative model and has redefined how we think about client relationships, um, operational risk, energy efficiency, and, and, and building sustainable businesses. Um, and, and as mentioned at its core, it, it provides an outcome hold air for the user. Um, and as such, you know, transfer that risk of the lowest operation cost from um, from the customer, from the end user to, to the supplier. Um, so a little bit of a, a snapshot of our journey is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, luckily for me, Florian uh, addressed quite a number of the, the items that I'm talking about as well. So hopefully I can get it a little bit faster. Um, in refrigeration specifically, it's all driven 
by lifecycle cost. And I think many of these subscription models work on that basis. Um, it, it's it's important to understand that when you look at life cycle cost of refrigeration systems, that the majority, the biggest component is electricity. It's 65 percent it, it as a kind of an average number. Obviously, this changes, you know, in terms of certain uh, systems, it's a little bit more and others, it's a little bit less. But it is usually about two thirds of the life cycle cost. Um, and the life cycle cost is really this the optimizing the life cycle cost is where this win 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 thing sits that that Florian spoke about as well. Um, highly efficient systems use less electricity. They might cost a little bit more to build, um, but if if one looks at the life cycle cost and you're spending ten percent more on capex. Um, and you're saving five percent on electricity. <clears throat> you can do the maths, but you're gonna you're gonna be well in the in the in the positive numbers um, by by having a little bit more efficient system through additional capex up front. Now this is the thing that customers battle with because they don't really know exactly are they paying the right amount of money for the electricity or are they using the amount of electricity that they should be using because there's no real way of knowing how much electricity a refrigeration system should use um, because there's not really a, a freely available meter that will tell you um, where you are in, in, in your efficiency profile of a refrigeration system. Um, <clears throat> then I think it's important to note that without this measurement, um, we've seen degradation of, of refrigeration systems in, in the order of two to five percent per year in terms of efficiency. And so that, that's a really big number. If you don't measure it, you wouldn't realize and it's almost a frog in hot water situation. It gets out very slowly and, and you only realize after 10, 15 years that you're in real deep trouble. Um, I think important here yeah, is, is maintenance um, plays a very big role uh, and, and something that it's, it's not only doing maintenance, doing the right kind of maintenance to maintain your system efficiency. Just important to stress in this whole life cycle cost um, scenario that one of the most important things that one shouldn't overlook is the, is the fact that the product that are being produced or stored in the cold storage facility, um, that value is so much more than the actual cooling cost or the, cost, the life cycle cost of cooling. It's a, it's a, it's a whole um, different um, uh, order of magnitude. And if you don't have uptime and you don't have temperature, the, the kind of risk that you are exposed um, to is, is significantly more than just let's say the operational cost of your refrigeration system. So this is important to keep in mind. So um, it was clear for us that we needed to shift uh, the risk from the end user to, to us as the refrigeration supplier, because that's where our, the skills lie in, in, in order to manage this effectively. Um, we, we decided to create a fixed cooling tariff for our customers based on the amount of cooling they use. We had to develop a cooling meter. Um, and that was the enabler for us over time to really um, to, to, to develop this whole cooling service product to its full. Um, for, for us, you know, providing and maintaining high efficient systems with its lower operational cost you know, that becomes then part of our income. And that's the, uh, Florian also mentioned that, you know, over time um, for for the supplier, this is really beneficial, but it doesn't come at, a, at an additional cost to the customer. So if you look at uh, my slide there, you'll see that there's profit that's being increased on both sides. The both the end user has the possibility of making more money as well as the manufacturer supplier. So it's really the efficiency component that's being guaranteed that is job driving this profitability both ways. Um, and, and really important for, for end users is there's an environmental advantage through reduced emissions because you're using less electricity. Obviously, there's an opportunity now to, to maybe invest in natural refrigerants where the systems are slightly more um, expensive. Uh, but not a lot more efficient and has longer life. Um, uh, a thing that many of our customers really 
are, are uh, positive about is that uh, is the operational focus of their management team. If you if you take away a very complex component such as a refrigeration system, uh, your management team has the ability to focus more on core business. Um, the predictability is something that Florian as well spoke about. So, so now it's easy to budget for next year. What is, what is my cost of cooling going to be? Um, yes, and then the, the capital outlay, <clears throat> I think we, we see that um, as, as not that important, but, but in many cases, customers um, uh, do like having the capital available to spend on actual production related or business related expenses. Um, if I take the simple example of, of, of retail, um, if a retailer has to buy the refrigeration plants for his retail store or, or he wants to expand and actually put a, um, a liquor sales next door, which one is going to make the most money? And a return on investment is going to be much better than in, in a little liquor store next to his, um, to his store. So that's the kind of thing that really builds this, um, this product. Um, important here, right from the start, we realized you know, that using data is key to the success of uh, servitization. Um, you need to, to measure, to manage. Uh, and when we talk about data, it's important to realize that um, data needs to be transformed um, into suitable action by skilled people to desire and, uh, uh, to, to achieve a desired outcome. Um, data on its own is not really very valuable. And we've seen what happens Often when customers um, or end users get graphs and data, I mean, this ends up in the junk folder, you know, after the first six months, uh, and nobody looks at it anymore. Um, so so really has to be action driven. Um, advanced refrigeration systems as, as it really <clears throat> includes a variety of different um, systems, each with um, the ability to provide data, um, it, there's a lot of technology that comes with this and, and, you know, things like communication protocols, maintenance requirements, compatibility issues, regulatory compliance. I mean, it's, it's, it's really complex to get that data in a usable format, reliably live into the cloud where you can, where you can work with it. Um, and, and this capability, like Florian said, can be outsourced. Um, we developed it in-house. Um, but yes, there's, there's many people that can, can assist with that. <clears throat> um, I want to talk a little bit about asset management <clears throat> because that's one of the key things that, that we had to develop uh, as a complete new business unit um, to be able to, to look after many, many assets that we own. Um, we, we've realized that these, these, this is a different kind of group of people, they have to be at the forefront of technology and innovation, um, understand, understanding a wide variety of systems. Um, they must unlock uh, performance and efficiency uh, for us as a, as a business. Um, part of uh, A large part of our income is driven by, by maintaining that efficiency over time, and that's quite a difficult job. Um, then I think the important the key priorities is, is this visibility, 24-7 visibility with real-time uh, um, actions to ensure uptime. Because if, if the system don't run, well, you don't generate income, but also your customer uh, can lose a significant amount of, of money through product losses. Um, then there's performance management. This has to manage the COP in real time as well. Uh, preventative and predictive maintenance tools um, is quite important for us to, to minimize the cost of, of running these systems, but also to, to manage uptime. Security and compliance, um, these are things that are very important to customers and, and also the gate, if you want to call it gatekeepers of, of um, performance in the system. If you're not uh, secure or you don't comply to regulations, it, it creates a high risk for, for, for the system. And then obviously client communication. And then that's something that needs to be ongoing over a 
15, 20 years with these contracts is effective communication with your client so that they understand what you are doing, how you are, you're a partner in their business, and therefore this communication needs to be ongoing um, and conscious be in the first year or two. Okay, so and of course, the true impact of cooling as a service is locked up in its ability to be deployed at scale. And, and this is where we, we turn our attention to the pivotal role played by banks, um, development finance institutions and policymakers in encouraging a greater adoption of the model. Um, this is very different from the traditional financing models, um, you know, and, and really not that much focused on, on just the capital component. It, it's definitely not a lease. And, and as a result, it's quite a bit of a shift um, that has to take place. Um, but um, with its focus on, on recurring revenue model, uh, it presents an attractive proposition for financiers who, who, who seek stable and predictive returns. Um, and it's quite predict uh, predictable. Um, also in financiers, we find wants to invest in the responsible energy space um, where there is continuous growth opportunities. They want to invest in companies that are committed to operating in a sustainable and responsible manner. And, and this is certainly the case with cooling as a service. You know, it allows our customers uh, it allows clients access to state-of-the-art refrigeration solutions um, and accelerate the adoption of energy efficient and environmental technologies. And that's really attractive for, for the financiers. So financiers becomes enablers um, and there's additional uh, drivers such as food security um, and social programs um, that, that uh, in places like Africa where there's a a uh, real problem with, with um, providing people with fresh and um, food that, that uh, the, uh, reduce the amount of food losses that we have. <clears throat> um, so the, the partnership between the product supplier ourselves and the financier is very important. Um, admittedly, one of the uh, issues is that cooling as a service requires equity and, and that is, is something that is a bit of a challenge um, when when you talk about um, uh, converting your business to, to do cooling as a service. Um, environmental um, aspects, and I've spoken about this quite a lot. Um, cool, uh, refrigeration is, is not, uh, refrigeration and air conditioning worldwide is a big contributor to, to greenhouse uh, emissions. And um, I think it's important to, to understand that things like um, poor design, bad maintenance and control manage mismanagement results in excessive energy consumption together with some really um, uh, uh, poor decisions for, of uh, synthetic refrigerants that has caused environmental problems. Um, that way for you to know your uh, in one minute or two, you should- Okay. <laughs> I think, yeah, so just quickly then, um, energy, excessive energy use is, is prevented um, because somebody takes responsibility for, for, for COP. Um, natural refrigerants are an outcome of this. Um, and I think ESG is something else uh, that, that needs to be on the table. Customers can report ESG much um, easier in, with the kind of contract that you have where you know exactly what your um, uh, consumption is going to be. And then uh, just the last slide. I, I actually, this is something that um, Florian also mentioned. As this is the win-win-win of pulling as a service. And interesting in Japan, there is a word for it or a phrase for it, uh, um, Sampo Yoshi, uh, which I actually... Uh, found to be quite a nice little um, uh, sticker, if you want to call it, um, that um, it's it's really what refrigeration does. It's a it's a, a situation. It allows as a product for customers to benefit, for the seller to benefit, and it's also good for society. I think that's it. I also only have a a little. Um, 
business, uh, 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 business case of, of uh, installation we've done, but we can skip that. I think um, uh, the metrics and carry on with the, the next slide. Actually, maybe connected to the case study you have, I see you know uh, persons are writing questions in the chat and in the Q and A section. And one question that popped up is, how what is the difference with a solar PPA and um, you know a, a product as a service offering? And I think here uh, because I know that Energy Partners actually you supply kind of a combination of solutions, and you're actually a part of an entity that not only looks at refrigeration but looks at providing an holistic approach to customers. And so maybe it would be interesting that you share a few words between the similarities, of course, of, of a PPA agreement with a customer. And in your case, how do you combine the two for um, for a yeah. customer? Yeah. So so both. Heating um, as a service, cooling as a service. I mean, those two things are the same. Same sides of, a, of, of two sides of the same coin. They put it that way, you know. So, so that's uh, whether it's steam or whether hot water, which we can also do with heat pumps. Um, uh, that makes it quite simple. The power side of things, um, power and batteries. Um, that as a service, the, the contracts are very similar. Um, but there's a few there, there's a few very specific things that comes with PV systems, and that's the choice whether you call the take or pay side of things. You have to buy whatever is generated by the by a, a solar PV system because I mean that needs to be used first. Um, while with refrigeration, it's it's actually you know just on demand. Uh, what is your cooling? So our business model works on that basis. Of course, if you if you can fit into the grid, um, that would be a different system that we're talking about. We're talking about rooftop um, embedded generation um, for, for customers. This is what we see here at Clover. And what we did, um, we actually combined um, the two systems, the refrigeration system and the solar system into a single solution. And we buy the power um, from the PV, actually we use the power from the PV in the refrigeration system to drive down the cost that the cooling, um, the cooling cost to the customer. So actually we use our own power that we generate um, at, at a lower cost and that really helps our customer to, 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 to achieve low cost cooling and for that matter low cost heating because of the waste heat that we recover and, and uh, that goes to the boiler systems. Super, many thanks, many thanks for that. And um, I know time time is running by quickly. I see additional questions for you, Dewi, but we'll we'll pick those in the in the Q and A session. Many thanks for for those insights, and um, we'll take the opportunity now to look at um, another sector where um, this type of approach is also applied um, in the lighting sector. Um, so I'll hand over to uh, to Dominic. Um, Dominic, please, the floor is yours. Okay, do you hear me and see the slides? Yes. Yeah, okay, so let's kick it off. Yeah, Sanpo Yoshi, I learned something new uh, today, uh, and I think we will see it uh, applied actually in the lighting industry, um, because talking about why did we opt, and are we so aggressively opting for SELAS, it's uh, not only for the value it delivers to the the, the clients, it also fits a uh, capability to make sure that we capture more of the value that we create ourselves. But to start with, it's about society at large. And, um, and if you reflect upon that and the challenge that we have as Europe to become carbon neutral by uh, 2050, um, knowing that the construction industry has 38% of that footprint today, um, you can say, well, let's not build any new buildings. For sure, that will help. Uh, but it also means that renovation should not only double, it should almost triple the pace uh, as, as, as the current pace that we see. Um, and that would pose to us a, a second challenge. And that's actually the depletion of our natural uh, resources. Because if we just continue the way we do it today, uh, yes, maybe we can reduce the carbon footprint, but actually we would waste a lot of those natural uh, resources. And that's why now I think it's roughly five years ago when we thought about who we were as a company, uh, 
imagining, I would say, the next phase of it, um, we said, well, we should be offering tomorrow's light to our customers, playing around a little bit with the words. Of course, I said it in my introduction, we already for 75 years in the lighting industry, we are bringing a lot of innovations to that market. So our customers expect from us that we would be doing the same uh, also going forward, but we want to do it in the, I would say, Coca-Cola light version. Um, that being said, so that the footprint that we leave behind would be a light footprint. Okay? So that's what tomorrow's light is all about. So what does that have to do with sales? And I think Dimitri's already started with that uh, at, the, at the beginning of this webinar. It is not about financing things. It is actually about a performance contract. Uh, Florian was hinting to it, and we are really taking it as an outcome based. It's not just give me light, but give me the quality of light and the energy savings that you promised me at the start of the project, and not within five years, not in 10 years, but up to 20 years from now. And that puts a lot of challenges on the shoulders of a, a company as, as ours to be capable of doing that. But we want to do that in a circular way. So we will always look at minimizing the impact. For us, it means uh, giving to our customers uh, what we call endless, effortless, and wasteless experience. But let's put that into practice. And maybe, Dimitri, you can share a video that is, well, having our customers talk about it. Absolutely. Just give me a second. Do you see my screen? I see your screen, but it's, yeah, shows Excel sheets, etc. cetera. I'm uh, Wim de Vermeul, uh, technisch directeur van deze campus, Campus Hemelvaart, die deel uitmaakt van een grotere groep, dus een Polischool. Wel, de, het gebouw waar we ons nu bevinden en waar dus ook uh, etap gezorgd heeft voor nieuwe verlichting, dat is een gebouw van halfweg de 60er jaren van de vorige eeuw. Vandaar dat we op zoek waren naar een systeem waarbij hij zegt van modern, eigentijds, met een mooie lichtspreiding over de ruimte en uiteraard met een zo klein mogelijk energieverbruik. Ja. We hebben dus voor dit project eigenlijk de, de behuizing, de bestaande behuizing van de verlichting behouden. Uh, de reflector, uh, de, lamp, de lamphouders eruit genomen en een op maat gemaakte module uh, ingepast. En heeft daarbij niet de plafonds moeten herstellen, uh, niet moeten schilderen. Uh, dus wat ook de kostprijs uh, voor uh, de school uh, enorm drukte op dat moment. Maar anderzijds was ik ook het idee genegen dat we binnen ons economisch model er anders tegenaan moeten en dat de, de mensen die, die produceren, dat die eigenlijk ook verantwoordelijkheid moeten kunnen blijven voor wat zij produceren. Wij hebben voor dit project een engagement van 20 jaar. Wij zijn 20 jaar volledig verantwoordelijk voor het goed functioneren van de verlichting. Dus wat er ook gebeurt, het is ons probleem, het is onze verantwoordelijkheid om te zorgen dat zij uh, een goede uh, verlichting uh, hebben. Verder uh, staat ETAP volledig in voor het onderhoud. Uh, op jaarlijke basis voeren zij een controle uit. En hoeven wij ons eigenlijk geen zorgen meer te maken? Dat betekent concreet dat wij daar dus als school zelf, maar als werkmensen, geen tijd en geen energie meer moeten insteken. Voor ons is het eigenlijk een, een, een pure winstsituatie. De klant die betaalt voor de light as a service een jaarlijkse fee. En die jaarlijkse fee die bestaat uit de investering, de financiering en de onderhoudskost. En dat is ook naar leerlingen toe niet onbelangrijk, omdat zij die, die planeet nog langer zullen nodig hebben dan wij. Dat zij dat besef ook krijgen van dit is belangrijk en dat ze daar vanuit de school een soort voorbeeldfunctie voor krijgen. Ik denk als school moeten we meer gaan inzetten op duurzaamheid, op het circulaire. Um, en dan moet, mogen we gerust zo'n projecten wat extra in het daglicht gaan uh, stellen. I give you back the screen. Okay. I will uh, take over from here. I hope you see again my screen. Yes. Okay. So what we have done there is not, uh, let's say, a normal type of um, 
uh, renovation of that school, we actually in certain places have now applied 20% less luminaires. 80% of all the existing luminaires were refurbished, giving 70% of energy saving, and that all with a 20 years performance contract. So it's up to us to keep to that commitment of having high quality uh, light. So at the center of what we are doing is that circular approach. And, and um, thinking from that perspective, the best thing that you can do is making a product that actually is endless. If a product doesn't break out, it's the perfect circular product. We all know this is not a reality possible, feasible, but then we need to make sure it's an effortless repair, refurbishment, even remanufacturing um, concept that is behind the product development of these products. And only at the very last moment, we should be thinking about recycling, because in a lot of cases, recycling means down uh, scaling, down cycling, rather than upscaling, upside. How do we put that into practice? Well, first of all, there's a big misconception with a lot of people. They think LED lighting burns forever. It burns for a long time, but every year there's going to be less and less light coming out of your lighting systems. So actually, like it's shown here, after 50,000 hours, it's quite normal to already lose 20% of the light. You can pump the LEDs up uh, by using electronics that are going to give more power to the LEDs. Then your lighting will remain stable, but actually you will consume more. So that's also not what we want. We have the capabilities in-house to not do that by us, those kind of drivers, but actually to keep the light level at the same level during a very long period of time. And that's for us what is true endless lighting all about. And that's what we put into our promise towards our customers. You can also optimize your lighting designs much better. Think about your projects from the start is always our statement. And like we did at that school in certain areas where we did not do refurbishment, we reduced the number of uh, light bulbs. In offices, we could reduce that with more than 50%. So also that is bringing uh, a better circular proposition to the customers. We also started to rethink the fundamentals of how we designed our products. You know, in the past for industrial lighting, there was a saying that's basically sealed the product for life because they are in very difficult to maintain areas. So just close them that no water, no dust could enter. Of course, that's the opposite of a circular product. So now we have products that are very good, very well fit for those harsh environments. And still all the critical components can be easily reached and being maintained. And last but not least, like we showed in that um, uh, video already, refurbishment. And, and, and for us as a, as, a, as a company, but also for our salespeople, that was quite a revolution because they want to sell the full product, of course. They have been used to that. And all of a sudden we say, oh, we will not sell anymore the full product. We will sell the modules that fit into the existing ceilings. Now, there's a small video on that, but Dimitri, as I propose that in view of time, we will not show it. Uh, basically, you can already imagine uh, from these pictures how it actually looks. So it's really minimal invasive uh, renovation that gives value to our customer that goes beyond lighting. We had one of our uh, customers who is a telecom uh, company here in Belgium uh, who has big office spaces uh, well occupied still, even with a, a lot of work at home uh, situation. Uh, so for them, it was a huge challenge to renovate their offices because it meant they had to move away their people into yeah, temporary office settings to do a full renovation. With this type of renovation, actually, people can continue to work. We just come in. It takes seven minutes to change every light point and we are out of it. So light as a service, that performance contract that we offer 
has of course different components to it, making the perfect lighting design to make it sure that it's a circular design from the start. If the, and to come to that, we do different kinds of services. We will first enter with the customer. We will do a quick scan budget to give them an, an insight in what type of investment is actually uh, required. We will look at is refurbishment possible or not. We will optimize the lighting design and we will agree on the performance parameters. And if that all is uh, settled, we bring forward a complete renovation uh, business case to our customers. If the customer wants us to finance it, we will do it. But actually you have more and more governmental uh, customers while they will not look at us to finance it at the best possible rate. They can finance it themselves at a cheaper rate. So in those circumstances, actually, the customer is uh, providing the financing themselves. We will, of course, supervise the installation and making sure that the commissioning of the systems is of top notch so that we are making sure that also in the future, those uh, lighting solutions can be maintained according to the performance contract that we agreed upon. And during the whole life cycle of the project, the responsibility of the maintenance re, uh, yeah, remains at, um, at ATAP. And when it comes to emergency lighting, where you need to be always norm compliant because people in the buildings are at risk if the emergency lighting system would not work, then of course, we will make sure that all those audits and reports are being put at the disposition of our customers. And finally, like I already said, at the end of the contract, we can do a lot of different things. Maybe it's a refurbishment option. Maybe the customer says, I want to uh, take the um, lighting solution into my own hands and you guys can do the service. Or maybe the customer says, we want you to take it back and in the most circular way, uh, reuse the components that uh, were in that system and that can still um, function. In a nutshell, it's about um, basically giving transparency to our customers when we talk about the total cost of ownership. We see that then in a lot of cases on the different components, customers are missing that. So in the very early stage, when we do those audits and we are building up the uh, business case for them, we help them to get the insights into the different uh, aspects. We also, and now we refer to that, you know, we reduce the risk of operation. Um, as such, a lighting system is, of course, not the same as a cooling system from an operational risk perspective. However, there's a huge technological revolution happening. And today in Europe, for example, you're not allowed anymore to sell the normal fluorescent lamps into the market. And a lot of customers still have them hanging in their offices or industrial uh, places. And they wonder, so what we will now do? Because in the past, well, you just changed the, the light bulb and you threw it away. And now all of a sudden that will not exist anymore. And if those LEDs are integrated into the luminaire, so how do you do then that whole maintenance? So that's a part of the risk reduction that we do. But it's also about people. More and more, uh, our customers find it difficult to find qualitative uh, people into their maintenance operations. And when they have those people, they want to put them on the business critical operations, not on the lighting part. So they like us to take that risk over for, uh, from them. And finally, of course, yes, it's an option to uh, uh, use your financing capabilities for your own business so that you don't need to spend it on the lighting. But I would say it's not only that, we also see that customers traditionally, they would basically renovate maybe one floor or two floors from the building because their capital expenditure budget was limited. Now with sales, they don't need to hold back. They actually can say to us, renovate the whole building and give us the advantages from an energy saving uh, opportunity immediately. And I showed already that that energy saving 
up to 70% in that case can really in some cases go beyond. We even had a case that we were 92.5% energy saving for our customers. So big savings that they can benefit from faster if we take over uh, that finance. Super, many, many thanks, Dominique. And um, one question that popped up, um, which I, I will combine with two topics and then we'll we'll shift to, to Elvira, is a lot of customers, as you know, um, in the market in Europe, um, you have access to subsidies. And so sometimes one question that pops up is, if I go on sales, do I still have access to the subsidies from one side? But as well, can I have uh, carbon credits uh, in the same way that I would aim to have them? So what are um, so this is applicable also, of course, in in lighting, in compressors, and in cooling. But from your perspective, how is this happening on the market? Yeah, so yeah, that's that's quite different per uh, per country. So you can't say give one answer to that. Um, uh, currently, we do quite some renovations of hospitals in the Netherlands, and and there uh, they can benefit from those um, subsidies. But it's all how, yeah, the, the countries are, yeah, defining the rules of the subsidies that they're providing. So I would turn it around, actually, <laughs> as a message. I don't know if there are people in this uh, webinar who are in a governmental uh, capacity, um, but there's still a lot to be done at the government side to make sure um, that these type of models are being stimulated. Maybe something to talk about later on, but for example, all the tendering, public tendering uh, that is happening, a lot of them are uh, not benefiting as a service models and the rules they are really need to be changed. So there's not one straightforward on, uh, answer to that imagery from my perspective. And it really depends on how the subsidy rules have been found. Super, many, many thanks, Dominique. And actually, I'll... I'll use that to make a, a transition to to Elvira. As we know, like one one topic that is very hot on the on on the customer table is to try to increase efficiency on on how they're operating their assets and so on. So connected to the thought of a of a efficiency as a service offering or product as a service offering, of course, if you relate your pricing to the customer purely on a consumption basis. That means, of course, if the customer on their side starts to optimize consumption downstream, your business model on a product as a service is uh, jeopardized, so to say. So there is really actually an incentive from the provider perspective to think holistically on how to deliver extra efficiency to the customer and to value that into their pricing proposition. So here I'd like to transition to Elvira, really that showcases a little bit how efficiency can be enhanced on the customer side uh, for compressors. So please. Um, Thank you. Elvira. Thank you, Dimitris. Uh, I would like to highlight, so I'm going to talk about the compressed air systems efficiency. So it's not a compressed air as a service, but it's efficiency of compressed air systems. And I just would like to guide our audience a little bit into the problematic of this, because uh, when we look at the industrial plant, uh, we have their various machines and production lines. Each of these machine and production lines, they have uh, instruments and those instruments, they actually use in compressed air for various operations. So whenever you see any blown applications, press applications, Actually, compressed air is the most expensive source of mechanical energy in industry. And uh, it's not so easy just to say, OK, let's do the generation part and do something on the compressor side. First, we should reduce on the instrument side and the production line and then adjust uh, the generation. So what, what is logical, right? Uh, it's very important topic because it's used in the various types of industries from food to cement, automotive and pharma. And uh, uh, compressed air nowadays is accounted for 20% of the overall uh, electrical consumption in industrial sector. So it's very big chunk of, of this. Good news and surprisingly, actually almost 60% of this can be reduced uh, thanks to uh, some measures. So 10% that we usually uh, look now, uh, we call it a fragmented measure. So we either do something with the compressor room, uh, we uh, do something with a little bit with leaks, maybe we repair um, tubing, but other 50% uh, 
uh, can be uh, really uh, decreased just because we use the uh, efficiency improvement at each single uh, place. So from the generation, from the distribution to the generation, and that would take efficiency holistically. This is why uh, energy efficiency of compressed air systems and not just of the compressed room becomes extremely important, extremely promising, but at the same time, a very complex topic. So it's exactly the same thing if we look in the household, if we look in the uh, cooling or heating as a service. So uh, we need to always take a look at the efficient design, uh, efficient technology that we use and energy saving habits, as we say, and audits. So best practices and audits. Um, when we take those measures fragmentally, for example, we use efficient technology. And here is just an example of a Moroccan steel manufacturer. They uh, bought a new efficient machine for their for their production for the operation, and the compressed compressor started to produce <laughs> had to produce more, or twenty five percent. So you think it might might be crazy, but actually, compressed their system was not designed to to handle this inefficient uh, component, this inefficient machine. So this is why it started to uh, had to produce more. Uh, Similar things might happen also on the audit side. Again, when we do only audits uh, and we provide roadmap for, for the factories here, for example, one uh, example uh, in the past five years, um, compressed their audits of 13 factory, 13 cement plants was done uh, and uh, good opportunities were found. Five years later, four uh, systems were worse, four were at the same level. So they implemented something, but it's again went worse. But uh, uh, three of them and just two of them were really had an exceptional uh, saving. So they really took audits seriously. So this is why it's extremely important to have the holistic approach on this. So when we look at this, we always focus on the linear supply chain, right? So we have this fragmented industry with various components, uh, various uh, stakeholders there have auditors, we have equipment suppliers. For them, efficiency is not priority. So they don't pay for the uh, energy bill and more efficient components they supply in the market, higher the prices, right? So they have to find this balance so to be still compatible on the market. This is why there are many efficient solutions that are available on each single step, but uh, it's usually for them hard to sell. Auditors and engineers, efficiency for them, of course, is important, uh, but in terms of price, it's again not relevant. So they don't pay for this. So because auditors is usually a smaller companies that uh, do the performance uh, audits. And of course, for industrial plant, this is people that <laughs> struggle the most. So they pay a lot of money for, for their energy bills and efficiency for them to in the priority. So coming to the efficiency as a service, we need to always to look as my colleagues here in the panel said before, in the win-win situation for the equipment suppliers, auditors, and industrial plants. It's of course, all of them have their um, pluses uh, that quite obvious. But the biggest thing and the biggest problem that I witnessed in the past 13 years working in the industry, it's high risk. And risk for them, it's uncertainty. So I call it efficiency uncertainty curve. So higher the energy efficiency performance is, harder it is for uh, factories to implement it. So they have just a fear of implementing new efficient solution, new efficient uh, design or approach or, or any, any other things. And it's basically uh, based on the, um, uh, it has few things. It has the integration of the ISO standards that might be also quite complex. Uh, policy integrations that there are not so many in our uh, field. Efficient technologies, again, they exist on the market, but they're not uh, widely implemented. It's not the best practice. Expertise, so we have, of course, experts, but it's not that everyone who who, who does uh, the audits uh, can actually handle complex solutions. Behavioral change, um, it, yeah, <laughs> compressed air, air is usually something people say it's inefficient, so it's uh, uh, not, uh, uh, it's something like dirty, we need like to take care of this, and uh, air doesn't cost anything, they actually don't get a bill for the compress, uh, compressed cost, and of course digitalization, so how to connect all of these various parts in, in, one, uh, in one system. Of course, our objective is to lower this curve, and uh, when we think about the successful project, so it will not go into the details, but I just want to show how complex it and how many stakeholders there are, right? So we start with the preliminary analysis first. And in the preliminary analysis, basically have the 
just ideas of how many how much opportunity factory has to save then we have a detailed analysis and the detailed analysis uh in direct and we develop the software we develop the platform a software solution that actually includes all the stakeholders and the steps uh, for the for, for those energy efficiency project as a service so uh, we we'll do the modeling and to working together with auditors that collect the data we already can create the roadmap of which kind of uh, equipment it's required, which kind of a design is required, what are the changes uh, has to be done uh, to have a, a better uh, energy efficiency, better, better efficiency performance of that system. So then we go into the part where there is the financial institutions coming. So either the customer can finance it themselves or uh, there is, uh, Florian said before that there are many uh, also companies that actually do this as a business, the financial part, and then we have implementation part with the contractors. So, and then contractors that are in the system, so they go and perform the work. And then the most important part, of course, it's the monitoring. So monitoring has to be done after the implementation and the preliminary analysis. So we can establish a new baseline. And this is where the money comes from. So this is where the uh, savings are coming from. And basically each stakeholder from this supply chain uh, shares those savings at a certain percentage regarding their work. So it is a win-win-win-win situation for the contractor, auditor, platform, financier, and the end user, because end user gets then pays after the project is fully implemented and he actually has the first savings. So he gets a bill lower with the, with the lower consumption. So after this, uh, of course, there is also decision support system that helps uh, to uh, provide the predict maintenance uh, for the uh, for the compressed air systems so the that they don't pay more and they can purchase easier the equipment and uh, another point that we also will be working on in the future is the uh, blockchain to control the uh, energy efficiency savings and to be able also to have a carbon credit based uh, based on the based on the blockchain but not not on the physical certificates but on on the smart contracts that will allow this ecosystem so as you can see, I think th there are usually like the questions, right? Why, why we need the energy efficiency, the service? Because for one company, it's very hard to get all the project done, to have involved all the all the customers there, all the stakeholders. And in general, energy efficiency projects are actually very, um, very expensive at the beginning for the for the end user. So, but then this is why uh, we developed the software application where the customer first can design and uh, understand what are the opportunities for this, uh, check what are the suppliers in the region, who are the contractors or auditors, the uh, portal for the auditors with the uh, various solutions and trainings where actually you can connect with experts. And these experts it include the ecosystem of the end customers of database and service providers. So basically we have the software as a service that serves to the stake of the energy efficiency uh, as a service connecting it. In terms of the um, payback period, I think this is an important thing just to show you a couple of examples. Um, up to 30, usually it's around 30% of energy savings per year, even though it can be also 60% depending on the, um, uh, depending on the state of the, of the system, depending also how much uh, uh, there is investment and ROI, but uh, ROI is usually below one year. So it can be one and a half year maximum or two years. But here, for example, we have uh, savings for uh, petrochemical was 32% and ROI 11 months or for uh, woodworking manufacturers. So furniture manufacturers, so it's ROI below one year for 27%. So it's uh, kind of like no brainer, but I think the complexity of the implementation of energy efficiency in compressed air system should be solved um, at, at some extent. So that's uh, that's it from my side. And I'm looking forward for any questions or comments on this. Super, many thanks, Elvira, and very interesting. Maybe one question uh, that pops to my mind and I'll, I'll share directly with you is, how would you compare compressed air as a service with compressed air efficiency as a service? Compressed air as a service, it's uh, uh, the supplier of compressor sells cubic meters of compressed air. So this is uh, this is the thing. In this, it usually includes like the maintenance, the performance, but the air is used somewhere, right? So uh, it's uh, the, the the most important thing is that the supplier usually of a compressor uh, they don't have a, a data 
about the demand profile. So they don't reduce the actual, actual demand. And it means that when we reduce the demand of cubic meters, the consumption of cubic meters, it will also be reduced for, for the supplier. And then he has to redo the uh, savings there. So, re so, so redo the price of the cubic meter. So energy efficiency as a service, it's kind of the customer pays later for this. So because first we save the energy, so that we reduce like the demand and uh, the demand, and then based on this difference, basically uh, after the implementation of, of the project, then the customer uh, gets uh, gets the benefits. So it's very it's very different. So here he pays for the utility, and here he pays for the savings and the uh, and the optimization. So keeping the, the system performant. Super many, many thanks, Elvira. Um, and it connects me actually, you know what we will do because I know we have uh, five minutes left. So um, we'll jump to the, um, to the round table conversation. I know we just have about five minutes left for, for this webinar, but that connects me to one question that actually was raised in the chat for everybody regarding the pricing structure of having um, a product as a service offering. And maybe here, you know, since you gave this answer, Elvira, I take the opportunity to ask also Dawi and Dominique and Florian on their expense, uh, experiences respectively. Yes, I, I think in terms of, of cooling, it needs to be connected to how much cooling is, you know, to the cooling supply. Um, because in that sense, you you lock in the efficiency in the tariff. If, if the tariff is excluding an, an efficiency component, um, it really doesn't doesn't make sense from a, as a service perspective. Um, with refrigeration, you know uh, that that locks in then that um, uh, the management of of the system. I hear what Alvira said about. There's also, there's also a component about efficient use of cooling. If you leave the door open, then you know you'll be using more cooling. It'll be produced efficiently, but you, you know, the cooling consumption is not really useful for the product. So, so those are that's another different component where where I think one should look at how you can assist the customer in reducing the consumption, but actually producing it efficiently in that that. It's important that that's in the tariff because it keeps the supply honest, in my view. Yeah, I mean, perhaps just a case I wanted to share also in, in, in the ventilation industry. Um, there, what we what we developed together with the client was a model where basically it's about guaranteeing an air quality level. Um, so if we think about the ventilation system, well, people don't like to be sold air to, right? And so in, 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 in that respect, how it worked, it was guaranteeing, well, how it works, it's like guaranteeing that 90% of the time you stay below a certain um energy um energy sorry air quality uh, so you it's guaranteeing an air quality but the fixed monthly fee that needs to be paid doesn't vary as long as you're not let's say below the 90 percent of the time uh, air quality and so it, it just it worked out from a customer point of view it's it's outsourcing and predictability of having the same rate to be paid every month if a certain performance is 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 being paid, what they didn't want is paying for actual cubic meters of air that were thrown into into the room. So I think it it depends strongly also on, on a real kind of case by case. Are we talking about industry customers? Are we talking about office customers? Um, hard to find like a single single truth there. Yeah. Thank you, Florian. Dominique? Yeah, well, I, I already explained that uh, in our case, it's truly a, a total cost of ownership uh, reflection, which is put into uh, into the monthly fee. Eh? So yeah. it's it's everything. It's it's the uh, installation, it's the commissioning, it's the maintenance, it's the, when required, taking back the existing luminaires and uh, reuse it in a circular manner, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah. And um, we'll we'll extend um, the webinar about five minutes for for 
the audience to have a couple of more questions answered. But for everybody to know the questions we don't have answer, uh, the time to answer, we'll um, try to collect them and to give a written answer uh, per um, per email afterwards to the attendees. One question that popped up, which is quite interested and interesting, and it's connected to what we're discussing right now, is what kind of MRV, so measurement reporting verification practices, do you use to monitor your EAS-based projects? Um, and so that's a little bit of an open question uh, to all of you. And um, maybe I'll start uh, with you, Dawi, and then we can go um, with Dominique and Elvira and Florian. Yes, yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, you know, we, we had to develop um, for the industrial refrigeration space, we had to develop a cooling meter, which is, you know, a billing type of meter, which we can calibrate um, against and, and, and something that is existing now. Um, that that was very really important to, to to have something that can be used for for billing purposes. It's it's very complicated in 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 the kind of industrial refrigeration applications that we work. But if you look at air conditioning, where you use chilled water, for example, that can be a fairly simple um, uh, technology to be used. The flow meter and, uh, and and some temperature sensors. So so each one of the of the these kind of um, as a service technologies, you know, some of them are pretty easy to, to measure and, and get the data um, that's needed. Um, and some is actually very complicated. And one has to think quite, uh, uh, what's the right word, in, in a around, out of the box way in terms of how um, you make sure that customers have, um, they believe in, in, in the outcome of, of measurements that, that, that are there because it has to be believable. Super, thank you, Dewey. Uh, Dominique? Yeah, so from our side, so we, we we actually always use complete solutions. So it means our luminaires with sensors, uh, but also with the monitoring and control systems combined. So that is, of course, to enable everything that we need to do with it. Now, in practice, it means that we will every year come in at the customer side and measure the light output. So to show and check whether it's still in line with our performance contract. And we will also uh, measure the um, nominal energy consumption, means with all the lighting on, uh, are we still uh, showing the energy efficiency? But with our systems, we can, of course, uh, go into much more granularity on um, yeah, what, what actually has been the energy efficiency. Um, we can also do predictive maintenance, et cetera. For emergency lighting, where by law you're obliged to do a test of your emergency lighting system and also check whether all the uh, products are still functioning. We do that audit uh, as well, which is partly on site because you actually need to physically check whether the products are still um, hanging there or, or let's say or functioning or whatever. Sometimes you can't uh, do everything by your systems. Uh, but for the rest, we monitor them from a performance perspective also by our system. Yes, Thank from you. our side, it's a, it's a monitoring system. So it's, it's got conventional flow sensor pressure sensors. But the most important part, as Dominic also mentioned, is the decision support. Because the component components wear, then there are additional uh, energy losses. And basically, with those algorithms where we can track, uh, OK, in two weeks, you have to buy this new filter. So you will not have the pressure drop. And then uh, this helps also to customer first to localize the energy loss uh i'm not talking just about the leaks but to localize energy loss and also to uh to take a decision on which components and where when he has to purchase uh from the from the supplier so because this will uh we have to promise that we keep the performance baseline after the optimization and uh algorithms is the more how we interpret the data this is the most important part brian you want to add no, um, I want to add that usually it's up to the provider to come up with, let's say, the monitoring tool. And in my experience, from what I've seen, it's not being second guessed that much by 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 end customers of kind of is this 
actually true not i mean it has it's it's being presented it's being explained the solution the tools being used to the customer and then once once it's up and running it's not after three years that kind of end customers are are, are coming and saying yes but is this actually true i mean they as, as as dominique was mentioning it's it's about energy savings they will see it on their energy bill in the end um mm -hmm not being second guessed that much from my from my feeling many many things and uh, i'll take oh. uh, just to clarify on that again sometimes the splitting it and allocating which which part of the infrastructure has consumed the energy yep. is still a challenge uh, yeah so there is no there is no pillow or... compressed air yes exactly this is why it's it's very important to have this separate uh monitoring for those systems oh. Maybe I'll take one more question and then I'll I'll wrap up the session. Um, here we have a question that says, how will, and I will combine it actually with two topics, how will the smart contracts be leveraged in terms of efficiency? And connected to that question um, is, how do you see that potentially enabling access to green bonds uh, for the activities uh, that you're doing? I'll let anybody that wants to take the question uh, answer first. Maybe I can answer from my side for first. Uh, uh, I think smart contracts, it really makes it easier uh, energy efficiency projects uh, when they're connected in one platform and one ecosystem. So it's uh, it can be left from the documentation part to the who is the contracting, who is the responsible. So it's a very good uh, tool to track the projects itself. But I think it's also a very good tool for the financing because when one company is saving something, maybe they don't want to invest the saving in something else and they want maybe to sell those credits. So it can be associated with the carbon credits, it can be associated also with the energy savings. And inside, the, if it, those projects can be connected in, in the platform, the customer can be connected uh, with the contract with the auditors, with financial institutes, as, as well as with other with other companies, for example. So I think this is somewhere because we're already witnessing on the market the uh, smart contracts that they're using for the uh, sales of solar energy between neighbors or in the, in the communities. But I think for energy efficiency project is a really big thing that will help us to uh, to accelerate it. Super. Um... David, Dominique, Florian, you want to add any? Yeah, no, I, I throw, from our um, perspective, let's say typically that's not a question we get directly, but what typically customer wants, can you, for example, via BACnet protocol, send the information and the data so that they integrate it into uh, yeah, systems that are doing actually the collection of whatever is being required. Um, so we are not, you know, yeah, that question is not popping up directly as such on our table. <laughs> we only do lighting. Yeah, no, from, from my side, I think, you know, be happy to talk to Elvira. She she's answered the question very well. And then maybe I can learn a little bit from her. <laughs> so, so it's I don't know that much about the subject. So yeah, well answered, Elvira. Great, great. Well. Um, excellent. I'll I'll take the opportunity now to to share my screen. Um, just give me a second. Um, excellent. So um, we took a little bit of more time, but um, I want to mention that I'll, uh, we will be sharing uh, the unanswered questions uh, per written per email, and also you will have the audience will have access to the recordings of this session online. Um, and if I have the green light from the, the speakers, we'll be sharing the, the slides as well. Um, now, a couple of points for you to know with regards to uh, this recording. You can, as I mentioned, view it on the Set Alliance web website, but also some upcoming activities we will be having within the Set Alliance. First, we'll be announcing the winners of the AS award um, that was up and running the past uh, weeks that will be done for end of October or beginning of November. Um, we also invite the, the audience to download again the Secure Economy Product as a Service white paper. And we will be running a workshop actually beginning of November on designing those contractual guidelines. So if you're interested to join, we invite you to write to us on the email of the Set Alliance, and then we can see if uh, you could take part into that workshop. 
And then, of course, we invite you to, to follow us on Set Alliance on LinkedIn, um, so you can see a little bit of uh, the news uh, popping up on our activities. And with this, I would like first, uh, last but not least, to thank our panelists today. So many thanks, uh, Dawi, Elvira, Florian, and Dominic for joining and for sharing your insights. And um, many thanks as well to the attendees for all of the very relevant questions you asked. It was a very dynamic uh, session. So we really appreciate that. And last but not least, um, like I said at the beginning of the session, uh, you will see now we have um, a survey popping up on your screen and we really appreciate feedback, your feedback on this session and any thoughts, additional thoughts that you have for us uh, to look into and to potentially have future sessions like this one uh, shared to the community. So with this, I take the opportunity to close the session. And again, many thanks for all of you for uh, joining today. Thank you, Dimitris, for organizing it. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks. Goodbye.